Hi, this is Mark Munoz, and you're watching the Choke MMA Show. It's the Choke MMA Show. And now your host, Eric Fontanez. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Choke MMA Show. I am your host, Eric Fontanez. With me, trapped in the television, as always, is ESK, E. Spencer Kite, a.k.a. General Zod. General Zod, yeah. how are you doing? I'm doing well. It's General Zod style here in the, as you like to call it, Canadian Southwest. Yes, sir. Uh, once again, back at it. You were really excited to start that. That was that was a really energetic hey. You like that? Are I'm trying I'm trying like, I'm trying to OD teach on caffeine. Me how to be energized on this show? But you by carry the show off. with all your energy. I try to just I try to mirror you as much as possible. I don't do a very good job of it. I don't think. In fact, I think you should host host the show. You should move here to California. I'll move to the Canadian Southwest and be miserable. How about that? Just like life swap? Yeah. I'll just, we'll just switch it out. You can come live here with my wife and my dog, and I'll, I'll move to, to L.A. and hang out with, with the future Mrs. Fontanez and Mini-Me 1 and soon-to-be Mini-Me 2. That's right. We <laughs> totally trade up. And for and once, her parents. And her parents. That's and right. Parents. And just be like, listen, Eric agreed to this. This is how things go. Contract sign. Got to go with it, babe. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so anyway, some fights happened this weekend. And the yes. world is panicking because Anderson Silva lost. Oh, no. MMA is over now. What are we going to do? <laughs> Shut up. Panicking and asking really dumb questions. Super dumb. What? Panicking and asking questions like, was it fixed? <laughs> that make you want to just slap somebody. Yeah. I think I almost did when I was watching the fight, but I'm not in jail now, so clearly I didn't True, slap yes. anybody. We're, yes, we're happy for that. Anderson Silva is no longer the UFC middle cha middleweight champion. Excuse me, I can't really speak. Uh, because he lost via technical knockout to Chris Weidman in the main event of UFC 162. Now, uh, leading into that fight card, a lot of people were pre were picking Weidman to upset Silva, you know, whether it be by by control, by right. submission, or, you know, yeah. all, all of these things were coming out of the woodwork. And what do you know? Some of them were right. He actually hit Silva with a left hook that <laughs> sent him crumbling to the floor in his eyes and the back of his head. Yeah. Now, there's another part of that. Silva was doing some real clownish nonsense in the octagon that really yes. cost him this fight. ESK, can you elaborate on that? Um, yeah, we, we talked about sort of Chris Weidman's potential and, and the challenges that he presented and, and sort of you were a little less sure of his candidacy to be a potential champion as I was. Mm -hmm. um, I never I admit it. I, I won't I won't yeah, I won't neglect there, that. There I wasn't admit it. any point that I was like, he's gonna knock him out because that's the last way I expected that to go. Um, but but what we got was Anderson Anderson being Anderson and a lot of people I think are are really overreacting to oh the antics and he overdid it and and he went to like this is what we were loving about him beating Stefan Bonner last October this is what we've talked about in a number of his like one of the things that made his performance against Forrest Griffin so amazing was that he dropped his hands around his waist and just started doing the lean back out of the way matrix dodging. and people were praising him for and, that saying oh exactly. do you see how Silva moves yeah, exactly. and so if he had if instead of getting knocked out, he had knocked out Chris Weidman with the if every piece of that fight was the exact same and the only thing that switched was the outcome and it was Silva knocking out Weidman, we'd be sitting here talking about how next level this dude is and how it's just incredible that he could do these things against great talents. Listen, the, the way it works out is that eventually this stuff catches up to you. Mm -hmm. Eventually the combination of 38 years old clowning a little too much facing a tough kid who walked out to tom petty nog him, won't back down and and clearly didn't um and and weidman gave it back to him a little bit and i liked that i liked that chris dropped his hands and stuck his chin out there a little bit and and was willing to sort of play off some of anderson's antics and and stayed in there and it it cost him this time absolutely if it cost him in the past we wouldn't have praised all his great performances that featured this stuff before and and i mean i think 
the part that really made it hit home to me was yesterday ed suarez was on mma hour with with ariel hawani and was like you know maybe anderson took it a little too far this time yeah you Which think? means it has happened regularly in the past. This wasn't a one-time thing. This wasn't something new that Anderson Silva did. He just got caught for the first time. And somewhere, Damian Maya is walking around wondering, why didn't I just punch him in the mouth? He did punch him in the mouth at one point. It actually shook him. I forgot if it was in the third or fourth round. But Maya ended up stepping up and actually saying, I'm not going right. to deal with this, and hit him once, and it shook Anderson. And I think right. from that point on, Anderson took the fight a little bit more seriously. Um, um, he didn't get the opportunity to do that in his fight with Chris Weidman, obviously. Right. I mean, he I, I've never seen Anderson Silva uh, be dealt a blow like that and have him react that way with his yeah. head, eyes in the back of his head, laying. Uh, I mean, his head was bouncing on the ground with each punch that Weidman was landing in the ground and pound. The part of it that was really like for all the conspiracy theorists out there that are talking about, oh, was it fixed and that? punch didn't look like anything watch the replay of anderson's eyes as you said rolling into the back of his head and, right. and and how out of it he looked the part for me that was the like full-blown confirmation and and that i would just show anybody that's you know got the tinfoil hats on is that anderson <laughs> is trying to pull guard on herb dean when like long after Chris Weidman has been cleared out of the space and Herb Dean's trying not to step on Anderson, Anderson's yeah. grabbing at his calves and stuff. Like Silva's trying to do a deep half yeah. guard on a guy that he thinks is his opponent, and it's really Herb Dean saying, okay, you're done, buddy. And, I mean, if you're going to throw a fight, don't you tap to that knee bar. Don't, yeah. don't you pick something him. easier than knock me out? He was, Rio Chonin was jumping up and down in his seat saying, he's going to get another ankle lock. He's going to get another ankle lock. So, yeah. I mean, that, if, if that's the case, if he was really going to throw the fight, you know, he would have tapped at that point and said, okay, I'm done with this and moved on with it. But I think one of the more interesting points of this, of this fight is Silva is saying that he's tired and, and he doesn't want a rematch yeah. and, and things That'll like change. that. Do you think that'll change? I think it'll change. I think I I don't think the tired will change. I think he very much I mean and and listen, I haven't been UFC middleweight champion of the world for almost seven years, so I can't speak from experience. Maybe one day, I, ESK. Maybe, maybe one, one day. day. I need to get down to middleweight first. Maybe do some sit ups. Um, <laughs> I can I could say that having talked to a lot of guys that have been undefeated to guys that have been champions for for long periods of time that stuff does wear on you there are obligations and there are pressures that come with that mantle that that do wear on you over time we've seen Anderson sort of bristle at some of the stuff he blew off a media day prior to this this event that had to be made back up uh, the Monday before the fight um, I've listened to the audio of that and it's you know, 58 minutes of Anderson not really being there saying much, yep. and then 10 minutes of him answering a couple of questions. Um, I mean, heavy is the head that wears the crown, right? And, and exactly. Af after this long, he's a little bit tired. He wants some time to just sort of step back, as he said, relax, take care of some of the things that he has on the side planned. I know he's got a couple movie roles coming up. Um, but Going I think Hollywood. It, at a, I think at a certain point, you sit back and, and, and look at that fight. If you're going to go out and you've been the greatest champion and, and the greatest fighter in the history of the world thus far, <laughs> um, that's not how you go out. Losing, no. losing happens and everybody, it, it catches up to you at some point. I think he for himself will want to find out if Chris Weidman can beat me when I'm I don't think he wasn't focused. I don't think he wasn't taking Chris Weidman seriously. I think Anderson is at that point where he's been able to toy with guys so much that let's see if I can toy with them. And usually there comes that point where he gets hit, as you said, like in the Damian Maya fight, and he's like, okay, now we'll stop clowning a little bit and we'll just we'll coast through the end of this. Or, or the Stefan Bonner fight where he then turns around and finishes it. He just didn't get that chance. And so I think there's going to come... because he got clipped. Where, right. He got clipped gonna hard. There's going to come a point where he sits and watches that and is like, well, maybe this kid could beat me, but I want him to beat me when I'm not presenting more opportunities than I necessarily have to. 
You know, you mentioned focus, and did you hear that Roy Jones Jr. took uh, <laughs> responsibility for uh, taking away Silva's focus? Did you hear about that? I did. And, yeah. And he'd been wanting to box it's... me. That's what he said. Yeah. For yeah, a long time, he'd been it's... wanting to box me. I think it's ridiculous that we're we're talking about uh, a guy that is still at the pinnacle of his sport, Anderson Silva, mm-hmm. and a dude that is on a very sharp decline, yes. Roy Jones Jr. In the same, like, there's been the talk of that was what they were going to do next, and they were going to bring Roy into the cage, and like. We learned from the James Tony fight that an MMA fight featuring a washed up boxer just isn't worth it. Yeah, but I think Jones is more aiming towards a boxing match with right. Silva because Silva's been, you know, said in the past that he wants to do a boxing match uh, it, specifically against Roy Jones Jr. and and Jones is still trying to sell it like it's well, of two he two is. of the greatest fighters in the world, but I yeah, think only one of them is the greatest fighter Roy's in the world. He's trying to sell it. Yeah. Of course, he's trying to push it as two of the greatest fighters in the world. He's the dude that's, like, riding on the biggest fight of all time because the other guy in the fight is massive. Like, <laughs> it's like me fighting. It's like if I was if if I was Peter McNeely. Like, Peter McNeely coming into his fight with, with Tyson could be like, it's the biggest fight ever. It's the most anticipated fight in heavyweight history. The biggest. I'm part of the biggest fight ever. And people are like, yeah, but Pete, it has nothing to do with you. You're just, you're a patsy, dude. And so, <laughs> did you just call Roy Jones Jr. a patsy? I don't know that he's a patsy, but I think it's very much a final flicker of that flame. Like there ain't well, much left for Roy. Well, and regardless, it, listen. If that's what Anderson wants to do, cool. Do it. Get it out of your system. I think we will see him fight Chris Weidman again. My guess is Super Bowl card in February in Newark, New Jersey sort of in tandem with the Super Bowl being at the MetLife Center or whatever right, it's called. Right, right. And I was just going to ask you, you know, final thought on this. Where Are we going to see Silva again, and is it going to be against Weidman? I mean, I think it's pretty clear that the only fight there for him yeah. is Weidman. And, right. and Dana White is saying, Vitor Belfort, as much as you hate Twitter campaigns and you're doing your Twitter campaign, right. you're going to have to wait. So... Yeah. That being said, Silva, we're we're MMA is not dead. MMA is not yes. over. Still Conspiracy alive. theorists, you need to calm down. You're at a ten. Need you at a four. Yeah. We move on with life, and we will move on with this show to the co-main event of the card. Frankie Edgar getting a win over Charles Dubronx Oliveira. What does this mean for Frankie Edgar, ESK? Um, it means he's back in the win column. That's. It really to me, is, is that simple. I think Frankie is, because he is such a big name, especially in that division, he's always going to be close to a title shot. Um, hard to get one when you're losing fights, even if they're two champions or you know previous champions in other divisions. It gets him back in the win column in a position to fight another top contender going forward. I don't think he's yet ready to to be elevated into a title shot. There's just too many guys ahead of him in the pecking order or, or on par with him in the pecking order. Um, it also, to me, like, and, and I wrote about it this week, Frankie just is, is forever going to be that guy that is in close fights, no matter what. It's not a knock on him. It's his style. It's it's what he brings to the table. And we saw it in that fight with Oliveira. There were, there were points where he had him rocked. He mm-hmm. just doesn't have the power or the size or whatever it is to put put guys away. And you know what's funny? He's that he, he, he dropped down to 145 so he can have that because he's right. more suited for the weight division, but he's still facing that problem being 145. I, I still believe he's best suited. Like, if you look at the construction of the divisions these days and, and the build of fighters in these different divisions, I still think Frankie's best suited to fight at 35. Wow. He may not want to, I mean, he talked about it at the post-fight press conference and was like, I'd rather retire than, than have Dana talk about 35. But I think he's he's not going to have that power. And, and the comparison to me is, you look at Cub Swanson's fight with Charles Oliveira, hit him with two really great shots, you know, rocked the body, went upstairs, and Oliveira drops. Frankie ripped off some really good shots and, and a very good technical fight, but doesn't have that power to put guys away. So there's always those stretches where 
Oliveira is able to get back into it. That then makes it a closer fight than maybe it is if if he does have that power and can finish things off. So I think he's always going to be near the top of the division. He's always going to be a couple of wins away no matter what happens. But for right now, he's sort of in that Ricardo Lamas, Chad Mendez, Cub Swanson group of yep. going to have to get a couple of wins Jose Aldo has a fight coming up at the start of next month. We'll see what happens from there and and sort of clear out things in the division. But featherweight's featherweight's great right now. It's it's the division I'm most interested in. There you go, Frankie Edgar back in the win column. Thankfully, avoiding that fourth loss yeah. in a row with the win over Charles Charles Oliveira. Obviously, didn't get the finish, but did enough to get the decision and the W at UFC 162. And now Tim Kennedy getting a decision win over Roger Gracie. Now, we, we both predicted Gracie would win this one, did yeah. we not? Yep. And we, I, thought, I thought we were going to be right in the first, first round. round I would, yeah, first round, I was excited. I was like, see, this is exactly what I thought was going to happen. Yep. Tim Kennedy's super confident in his takedown defense and his defensive wrestling, and, and now Roger Gracie's on his back, and that's the last thing you want. And, and hey, credit to Tim Kennedy, defended really well. Um, actually reversed the back mount at the right. end, end of the first round. Right. And came I even said second. nice reversal. I didn't even expect that. <laughs> yeah. Came out in the second and third and, and took the fight to Gracie, who still seems, it seemed to me, a combination of tired and dejected. Yes. Like, I think he's a dude that has had so much success when he gets your back or gets you in dominant positions that when he's not able to finish you, or beat you up like we've we've seen him go beyond the first round but he then comes out you know he's he's worn guys out and then comes out in the second and stops them mm -hmm. but when he gets to that point that he's not able to do that i think it sort of takes something from him and he gets into that okay now what i do yeah i just had my best opportunity and my best wasn't good enough so now what yeah and you know he ended up speaking to graciemag.com uh after the fights and explained that he was just extremely tired. He was exhausted. He said, quote, I felt like I was going to collapse in the octagon against Tim Kennedy. I mean, that might say something about his stamina. It could be, you know, that he was sick. It could be that the weight cut was too much for him. Because don't get me wrong, a week before this fight, we went to go see Roger, and he was, he was still pretty big. Yeah. He, he got, the man has a huge frame. Yeah, and he the, had to cut a lot of weight to get a 185. Yeah, the cut definitely is is a big cut. Not from, you know, he's not a guy that balloons up between fights. It's just as you said, he's 6 foot 5. Yeah. Like he is a, a great big dude. Man. And so just regular everyday life with that frame, you're well above the middleweight limit. Yeah. Um and so getting down I mean, we both talked about it beforehand. It feels like a great division for him because it presents advantages because of his size. But at the same time, and, and Joe Rogan talked about it during the fight itself, it presents some difficulties as well because that cut can be so draining that, that no matter what kind of stamina you have and what kind of conditioning you've done beforehand, getting down there just takes so much out of you and it takes does. such a toll on your body that after that first round may not be much left in reserve. And I, all I was saying after that first round is that Roger, and this is the thing that I was mostly concerned about leading into this fight is his stand-up. Roger just needed to jab for three rounds. He needed right. to stay on the outside and use that massive reach that he has over most of the people in the middleweight division and just jab all day. And he would have at least gotten a, a, a decision win with that. But, you know, of course... Stamina played a role, and no, taking nothing away from Tim Kennedy. Tim Kennedy went for it, just like we had predicted, and but he didn't get caught and ended up getting a decision win over there at UFC 162. Also, this is the one where we disagreed, and I'll let you have your moment of zen, Dennis Seaver and Cub Swanson. I pred predicted Seaver, you predicted Swanson, and the winner was... Winner was Cub Swanson. There you go. Technical knockout. Um, I'm not gonna gloat, man. I'm just really. I'm, yeah, I'm giving I'm you not, your opportunity now. No, it's now I, or never, man. We disagreed, and I and I understood 
you know, where you were coming from with how with the nice of you. pick. How nice of you um, to do it to do this on the show because before we started taping, he was saying, Oh, by the way, bum 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 yeah. bum Cub Swanson. But it's nice that you're actually taking the uh, the gentle approach while we're doing yeah. the show. It just, I mean, to me, Cub Swanson is a dude, and, and we talked about it in, as we were disagreeing in this. He is locked in right now, and, and we talk about it in sports that play every day and that we see, you know, three, four games a week where guys are just they go on a really good hitting streak or, you know, they're knocking down everything. Danny Green at the start of the NBA Finals, for instance. Yep. It's a little different to, to put into context in fighting because they're not fighting every week, and, and there is such distance between each fight and each camp um i've gotten a chance to talk to cub before each of his last few fights and and we've sort of talked about the confidence that sticks around after that first win then after that second win and then you get in the gym and you know what you need to do to get back to that level of crispness and get back to that feeling that you had going into the fight and and he's just continued to feel that since the george roop fight um a lot of that came from not feeling really just being happy to be in the cage with Ricardo Lamas in his, in his UFC debut after all the injuries that he had been through and after the different struggles that he's had to now he believes that not only do I deserve to be here, this is my cage, you can't beat me. Yeah. If I'm on point and I'm prepared, I'm one of the best in the world. And, and I think we've seen that over the last few fights. Rebounded from a tough first round to, to get a good finish of, of a tough guy in Dennis Seaver. So five straight is... is Hard to argue with in that division right now. Definitely. And obviously, Frankie won his fight there. Um, Jose Aldo has a fight next month. What's going to happen, man? <laughs> I don't know. A lot of people right away, of course, did the, like, they're on the same card. They're in the same weight class. So it seems pretty easy of, of Frankie Edgar and Cub Swanson. I mean, I it makes under- sense, right? I, I mean, it makes sense. I, I don't think that Ricardo Lamas is going to want to wait around for that winner. I know he's right. talked about talking to the UFC about, you know, asking for, for next, basically. Um, it's going to be, you know, December, January, maybe even February before that Eesh. fight comes together. And, and I don't think time. he can sit out for 13 months. No, I like Lamas to fight Frankie Edgar. It's a fight that was on the table br- ever so briefly in the past. Um, Edgar, as we talked about with his fight, he's one of the biggest names in the division. Right. And so he's the kind of name that you need opposite a guy like Lamas, who has continued to fly under the radar, even though he's got four straight wins. I think Cubs at a point where where he ends up fighting a guy like Chad Mendez, if Chad gets through Clay Guida, they're both on a similar trajectory in that they're a little bit behind a couple of guys. Chad has looked great, but needs a needs a couple big wins before he can be back in that title mix mm-hmm. it's only been you know 18 months since he lost to jose aldo i think that's those are the two i would go with that's the that's the setup i would go with but i wouldn't argue with uh a cub swanson frankie edgar fight you wouldn't Edgar's argue coach. with anything you, you said it before that 145 pounds is fun for you so you're oh, just great. you're playing it's matchmaker so, in your head and you're just having it, a good old time ain't you it's such an entertaining division right now and and it has been for a while so it's cool to see that that they're getting some of that recognition it was great to see two fights from featherweight on the main card on the pay-per-view card um and both took home fight of the night split up a, a split fight of the night honors yeah um or each got fight of the night honors as opposed to split because they all took home 50 grand hey um which, you know, shows you where this division is at. Jose Aldo is one of the best in the world. Uh, Korean Zombies on a nice little run. Ricardo Lamas, Cub. Frankie's back in the mix. Chad Mendez has looked good. Nick Lentz has got a few good wins since, oh, no. since moving to the division. Nick Lentz again. Got to get a Nick Lentz shout out. Since the podcast days, Free we've been Nick talking Lentz. about Nick Lentz. Free Nick Lentz. And we still need to get Minden Hall on the show. <laughs> So that he can justify Nick Lentz being the pound for pound best fighter in the world. Yes, I just said that. Nick Lentz is considered by a couple of professional writers to be the pound for pound (laughs) best fighter in the world. But that's another show. Just get him on a main card, man. That's all I want. Just let the man have some TV time. Talk to Mike Pierce. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. Who, by the way, hey, did message received, right? Went out and did what he needed to do. He did. Didn't look like it was going to happen in the first round when, when it looked like it was going to be Pierce is going to Pierce, but caught that short caught that short hook early in the second and uh, got the finish. He got the finish. Maybe he'll be on the main card one day, but <laughs> let's talk about another main card fight. Mark Munoz and Tim Boach. Mark Munoz down 75 pounds or something coming yeah. back to middleweight and back on the winning track he obviously did very well with a unanimous decision win over tim bosch um i considered it a manhandling i spoke with mark earlier today and he uh and he doesn't consider it a manhandling, but he was, you know, because Mark is always going to be humble yeah. and whatnot. But he came through and did uh, some big things in order to get that W, didn't he? He did. He looked, this was, in my opinion, the best that we've ever seen of Mark Munoz. Um, physically, of course, because of the transformation from, from the 260 down to, down to his fighting weight and his weigh-in weight. Crazy. Um, but just performance-wise, this was the most complete we've seen. A lot of people questioned a little bit of, of how much we maybe his wrestling credentials and pedigree was, was overstated going into it. I think he showed that that's not true. Um, I think he showed that he's he really is, when he's healthy and focused like this, can be a guy that's a threat. I don't think he's in that position, as he talked about at the at the post-fight presser, to sort of step in for Anderson if Anderson really is stepping out right now. I think he's got a little bit more work to do, but this was a very good starting point for him and a very good sort of first step back up the ladder mm -hmm. after a very rough loss to Chris Weidman Absolutely. and a very long year to get to this point. Absolutely. And we could sit here and analyze this fight ourselves because that's what we do on this or. show. We analyze. Or we could let Mark do it himself. Uh, just feeling amazing, man. Uh, just super excited after the fight. Super excited to actually go into the fight. Uh, a lot of preparation was was uh, involved in, in just being ready for the fight and uh, it did, did well, did well, and went out there and executed the game plan and uh, played the Donkey Kongas a little bit and controlled them on top. And but it was accumulation of uh, just all the all the guys that are around me, and um, yeah, I'm just truly blessed to have to have a great gym behind me, a great training center, and you know, with all the coaches that that I have, you know, Keaton Gracie, uh, Paula Blanc. Uh, my strength and conditioning coach, uh, Todd Norman, Sunfair with my diet, um, uh, Riley Ross has been keeping track of my strength um, gains, and, uh, and Sam Calavita that's been helping me with my testing, um, and all the guys here, my training partners, they've just been instrumental in, in just preparing me for battle. So. Uh, too many to name, but uh, you know, it's just, it was it was great just to just to be in the octagon again. It was over a year, and, and it just felt like home. Um, I wouldn't say I manhandled them, but I did control them. I did uh, I did take them down and, and beat them up on the ground, and I, I executed my game plan. And it was hard for him to, to stop what I was doing to him. I, I didn't think he knew that I was going to inside trip him so many times or double leg him against the cage, and, and I just try to keep it. I try to keep myself unpredictable as well, with moving the angles and being more athletic than he was, and, and making sure that he wasn't in the position to be able to use his strengths against me, whether whether it was in a clinch or against the cage or anything like that. So, so I made sure that I was. I put the fight where I wanted it, and and uh, made sure that, that I execute my game plan. When that happened, I just, I, I thought to myself, just keep, keep on your game plan, just be, be smart, don't, don't, uh, don't be hasty about anything. And, and um, so I did that, and then all of a sudden, when I saw his hands drop, then I was like, okay, it's time to open up a little bit. So I came up with, you know, some Superman punches. I tried to throw a flying knee and, um, <laughs> You know, and, and I started doing that stuff because I felt like he, he was tired. And uh, and then I got scolded by my, by, uh, my corners. Hey, hey, be smart. <laughs> and I was at the press conference and Anderson Silva said that he doesn't want to compete for the belt. And 
that he wants to do um, super fights and, and that he wants to rest because he's tired. He's been defending the belt for a long time. So, so I raised my hand. I was like, hey, I, if he doesn't want to go, I'll, I'll step in for him, you know. So um, definitely would like that rematch, but at the same time, you know, if, if Anderson should take the rematch, then, you know, there's a, there's other guys there that will give me a step closer to becoming a world champ. Um, you know, there's, there's Michael Bisming, you know, there's uh, Vitor Belfort. Both would be a huge honor to be able to fight. They've been there for a long time, and they've, uh, they've you know, they're, they're high contenders, you know. So, so I definitely want to fight the best, and it'll be an honor to fight those guys. You know, if I if I get a match with one of those guys, win, it's gonna gonna, it's gonna put me up there. So I, 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 you know, with with me at the position I'm at, you know, I'm, I'm in a very good position. You know, with the, with a dominant win over Tim Boach, it's definitely gonna catapult me to where I want to be in the division. So this uh, Keep Olympic Wrestling shirt that I have on um, serves two reasons. One is to benefit a wrestling club in Moore, Oklahoma that was devastated by the tornadoes there. Uh, it was an F5 tornado that swept across Oklahoma and, and wiped out a huge part of, of Moore, Oklahoma. So, you know, Oklahoma State's where I wrestle and I have, I have, I have some roots in Oklahoma and, and I definitely want to help out and give back as much as I can. So 100% of the profit that's made from these t-shirts are going to go to that wrestling club there in Moore, Oklahoma. It's called the Moore Takedown Wrestling Club, and they're going to they're going to be able to revitalize the program with with uh, um, with the money that we, we give them. And also with Keep Olympic Wrestling, I want to create awareness for people to to um, sign positions to go onto the website Keep Wrestling. KeepOlympicWrestling.com to be able to um, to be able to keep Olympic wrestling in the Olympics because it was banned. Uh, IOC banned the sport of Olympic wrestling out of the Olympics in 2020, and so I want to be able to create awareness about Olympic wrestling because if they ban it and it's totally gone from Olympics, it's actually going to take away hope from a lot of kids and a lot of a lot of men and women. And children to be able to uh, to be able to go into the sport of wrestling so so wrestling has been a huge part of my life and I want to be able to give back as much as I can to the sport you can actually go to my website markmunozmma.com and there's a link to an eBay uh, eBay site on there that you can actually purchase uh, the t-shirts on there so uh, so make sure you do that and there you have it ladies and gentlemen Mark Munoz Victor at UFC 162 over Tim Bosch. ESK, give me your impression of that fight really quickly. I think he did very well. Were you were you jumping up and down and screaming? <laughs> I wasn't. Ju I was jumping up and down and screaming in that you know take off the journalist hat and and the unbiased hat. I talked to Mark before this fight. I've talked to Mark several times. He is, as we talked about last week, one of the nicest human beings on the face of the earth. And Absolutely. so it, it, it's always great to see someone of that caliber of person succeed. Um, not that I wanted anything bad to happen to Tim Bosch necessarily. Right. Also a great dude. But it was it was really good to see Mark have the performance that I think he knew he was capable of, I think a lot of people knew he was capable of, and to be able to have it and, and have everything he's gone through this past year sort of translate into something and, and be, be have that end result that, that makes it all worth it was, was really cool to see. Absolutely. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. UFC 162's main card broken down from top to bottom. But let's talk about some other MMA happening in the world this weekend. Invicta is going down, and who's going to fight ESK? Because I know you want to break down this card <laughs> so badly. Invicta FC is back with their uh, their sixth show this weekend, headlined by a women's featherweight title fight. Marlus Conan against Christine, I'm not sure what we're calling her last name, Santos Justino. We'll just call her Chris Cyborg. Chris Cyborg. Um, the rematch! The rematch. Obviously, they fought back in Strike Force uh, when both were still there, and, and Cyborg was the champion. Mm -hmm. This will be for the vacant title 
in Invicta. Um, obviously still a really impactful fight, even though, you know, everybody's sort of caught up in the UFC women's division right now, which is the 35s and Ronda Rousey. Mm -hmm. um, Cyborg has talked about, you know, that fight being something that she's looking for. Obviously talked this week about, no, it's, it's 45 where I want that fight. Mm -hmm. Regardless, this is two of the top female competitors in the world two of the best at this weight class and and i think anytime you get that happening it's worth watching it's it's entertaining to see uh marlus kunin did the best against cyborg in sort of recent memory recent being like three or four years mm. um this won't be a jan finney ragdolling this won't be <laughs> this won't be cyborg's first fight under the invicta banner against fiona fiona muxlow um Conan's Coonan's tough and and you know there's still all the questions that people have about Cyborg set those aside she has been a ferocious athlete the last couple of years um, and anytime we get to see her compete I'm interested I want to see it I will be Absolutely. watching this I will be watching this this weekend it is a very entertaining card top to bottom and it's on um, pay-per-view is it not and it, it is on pay-per-view hey. making the move for the first time good for um, you Invicta. congratulate yeah congratulations to shannon knapp and janet martin and everybody involved with the promotion hey, hey. for getting to this point um and for always putting together cards that feature both established stars like the main event fighters and young up-and-coming talents uh rose nama Hunis is back taking on ticia torres which is a very good fight between two fighters who are just two and oh but have built that momentum already because they've been able to be under the Invicta banner. That's Pat and Berry's girl, by the way. Isn't that it? is Pat Berry's girl. Yes. Um, and and Pat has very much said that he he looks forward to the point in time where it's not Rose is Pat Berry's girlfriend. It's Pat Berry is Rose Namahunis's boyfriend. Ha. That she surpasses him in terms of skill, recognition, everything like that. Good for them. Um, there's, best best there's, couple in MMA. Yes. Very, very entertaining. Very fun. Couple. At least the Good most people. entertaining. Yeah. Good people. Follow them on Instagram um, and Twitter because they're both they're both entertaining. It's but just a bunch of a bunch of good entertaining fights on this card this weekend. Just with with fighters that are, you know, hungry and on the come up and, and looking to establish themselves. If you haven't seen Joanne Calderwood fight yet. Or if you don't know her, her Twitter handle, which to me is one of the best out there, Bad Mofo Jojo, um, <laughs> she is a ferocious striker. She absolutely torched. Her opponent's name is, is escaping me from last time, but was throwing crazy elbows the entire fight. It was a phenomenal performance. She's back. Uh, Team Alpha Male Bantamweight, or sorry, Team Alpha Male Featherweight. Veronica Rothenhausler's back again after her first round knockout win last time. Uh, Leslie Smith has done well throughout Invicta in terms right. of entertaining fights. Always count on them. She's back. Sarah Delelio. It's it's another really good card from from an organization that, in the span of a year and a half, has really established a footing as not only the best female promotion there is, but but one of the best around. And so, congratulations to them, and and be sure to check them out this weekend on pay per view. If Invicta is hiring a publicist, <laughs> E. Spencer Kite is available because clearly have, he is the biggest fan one. of Invicta I know. They have a very I mean, apart good from all their other ones. Abramowitz, yeah. But no, uh, Abramowitz I, getting I'm a mention on the Choke MMA Mike, show. Mike Abramowitz getting a mention. I'm always open for extra money, so if Shannon has my number. <laughs> if she happens to hear this and needs somebody to help promote at any point in time, the Choke I'm MMA show, it. aka. ESK's digital resume yes. is coming at you every <laughs> Wednesday. And I think that I think that's gonna do it for this week, man. Good that's show. A good way to end. That is a good way to end. By by throwing your resume out there and saying, yes. you know what? I'm available. Come at me. Because yes. the Choke MMA show ain't paying me no money that I could really, really live off. Jelly beans and magazines. <laughs> that's how we roll at Grace Mag. But for E. Spencer Kite, I am Eric Fontanez. Thanks for tuning in to the Choke MMA Show, and we'll see you next week. Peace.